an oncologist, a medical oncologist, and then currently the physician in chief, and the chief medical oncologist, uh, chief medical officer uh, at Memorial Sloan Cancer Center. Um, next to me is David Solly. Uh, David Solly is a medical oncologist, and he is the chief of a new center that we have established, which is the Maria Jose uh, uh, Henry Travis Center for Medical Oncology. That's where we do uh, all the sequencing. Uh, these guys sequence every year thousands and thousands of genomes of tumors. Next to David, we have another David, uh, David Hyman, um, medical oncologist. He looks young, very young, uh, but he is the chief <laughs> of our phase one program. So he is in charge of uh, uh, all our clinical trials with this new very special compound that we are testing in the clinic. And then uh, next to David, uh, we have uh, Nicholas Schultz. Uh, Nicholas is a biochemist by training, a computational biologist by heart. Um, and he's a person that could be responsible for putting together one of the best portals that we have uh, today uh, in the world of genomics, which is the well-known C virus portal. That's where we put all our genomic data uh, from our patients, and that's where our clinicians uh, uh, and scientists around the world uh, have the capacity to, 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 to access. So, um, as an introduction, just to, just to get started, I'd like to lay out uh, some of the challenges that we are facing. Uh, never until now, uh, we had the challenge of dealing with big data as, 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 as we do. Uh, we have an emergency getting um, records, full records on uh, patient's features, outcomes, surgeries, therapies, toxicities of over 3 million patients. And that data is sitting there totally unmined and totally uncapped. So uh, we are not even benefiting from all the data that is there that we could learn from. So how to manage big data is a big uh, challenge, but at the same time, a big opportunity. Uh, recently, we uh, were the first institution in the world that started sequencing tumors in, in, in a very massive way. So we have uh, uh, a platform that David uh, Solly will talk to you about, in which we are looking at the most frequent infections in cancer, and also looking at tumor mutations. How to integrate that data? How to mine that data? How to correlate those mutations in tumors with outcomes, with uh, therapies that are more efficacious, with side effects? It's a big, big deal. Um, how to uh, understand value? Um, uh, how whatever we do uh, results in improved outcome for patients? That's also a big time. At the moment, in which healthcare is under tremendous constraints and in which cost will be uh, uh, be at the center of many discussions. Healthcare is not is not a commodity uh, based on just money. Uh, we have our own data uh, from a uh comparing five-year survival from our patients compared to the rest of the US. And at our site, our patients have 32% better survival, 32%. And this is not really better. This is between the life or death than in the, uh, than in the average uh, uh, US uh, site. Uh, so um, it's very important that we can understand what do we do right, uh, how we can improve things for us. So let's get another challenge. So how to mine our patient records, how to mine the genome, how to match genome and patient data uh, with outcomes. Down the line, how to identify family members of patients with cancer that are at risk to develop cancer due to genomic alterations. How to prevent uh, this cancer to occur. How to intercept uh, this cancer earlier. So many, many questions, as you can see. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna let them uh, explain to you what they do, the challenges. And then we'll take it from there. Okay, so, uh, so I'll just start off by telling you my story, which is uh, how I got to where I am, um, what was the path I took. And so 
just to go all the way back to college, um, I was a computer math major um, in college. There was only three uh, my year of Penn uh, out of 2,500 students, so it wasn't wasn't the most popular major. Um, but I was very interested in computers, uh, interested in mathematics, interested in, in, in medicine. Um, so I got a degree in computer mathematics and then went on to medical school. Um, and was very interested in cancer. And my personal story was that my aunt had breast cancer, um, had a uh, very difficult 10-year battle with it, ultimately died um, right uh, when I was finishing up medical school. Um, and that personal story really prompted me to go not just into medicine, but then into oncology. And so the path that you take there is you go in and you get your medical school degree. Um, you then have to go into clinical training. And I did what is called an internship and a residency. Um, where you work in the hospital and you get practical clinical training. Um, I chose internal medicine because that's the path towards oncology. Um, finished three years of internal medicine training, working in the hospital, and then specialty training in oncology, and actually came to Memorial Sloan Perry um, to do that specialty training. And what we do there is we do a year um, taking care of patients who have cancer, learning how to treat them in the clinic, and then you go off and you do research um, for a couple of years. And at that point, you know, I looked around and, and you know, saw the type of treatments that were really available to our patients um, and really wasn't happy with them. And thought maybe the best way I could make an impact um, was to go into the laboratory and discover new treatments as opposed to using what was available um, as clinical tools at the time. So I actually went in and did a more basic science research effort during my fellowship um, did a, a what's called a postdoc fellowship um, in molecular pharmacology and learned a lot about drugs, learned a lot, of, a lot, a lot about cell biology. Um, and while I was in the lab, um, you know, learning how to be a, a biologist, um, this one, right? uh, <laughs> learning how to be a biologist, um, what was coming along was this incredible revolution um, with cancer genetics. And so just to state it very clearly, um, cancer is really a genetic disease. It's a disease where there are alterations in the genes that make up the proteins um, in our body. And what happens oftentimes is these genes get disrupted, where they get turned on all the time, or maybe a gene that suppresses the growth of the cell gets turned off permanently, and that makes the cell grow uncontrollably. And if we can figure out what those specific genetic alterations are, we can find the underlying cause of the patient's cancer and we can develop drugs that specifically target those mutations. And that's really what Dave does now in the clinic, and we'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But to just understand the scope of the problem, each human genome has three billion base pairs of inflammation. Um, and so identifying these single mutations within a data set of three billion um, is really looking for a needle in a haystack. And so as someone who went into the clinic doing clinical care and then working on biology, all of a sudden I was in a, a place where maybe having a degree in computational mathematics um, is of some sort of utility. Um, and that really took me into a third part of my career, um, going from clinical medicine into pharmacology and then into um, cancer genetics. Um, and really timed it well, I guess in some ways luckily, um, that when the technology became available that you could sequence Higher genomes, my lab was prepared to do that. My actually, my lab actually did the first whole, whole genome sequence um, of a patient with bladder cancer, and that's now been repeated in other cancers. Um, and it's something we're starting to do um, routinely. And I'm just comment that along the way, I actually didn't stop any of my older career. So I actually have three jobs now. I, I see patients every Monday um, in clinic. Uh, those patients have cancer. Um, I work in the laboratory, run a research lab where we try to develop new drugs um, using the biologic understanding um, that we, we, we're trying to generate. And then now a third career is sort of as a cancer geneticist. And really, I think the secret of my success has been trying to combine all three. Um, so someone who can understand clinical medical problems, someone who can understand biologic problems, and someone who can understand cancer genetics, if you can bring that together, sort of cross those fields, that's allowed us to make innovations that I think someone who's siloed in one of those three uh, you know, departments um, would have difficulty with. So let me pass it along to Dave, because he's really taking a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do, he's trying to bring these people. So uh, get to me right to turn the mic on while you're talking. And then actually All right, so uh, before I start, I just tell you a funny story that this morning I'm 
get ready and I see him talk in my life and uh, it's a conversation now where I say, I'm going to the clinic today, get my suits and the clinic for patients. And I say, you know, after the clinic, I'm going to go to Google's campus and I don't think I'm going to see another suit there. And uh, so anyway, it's just a <laughs> uh, to, uh, actually. Um, so, uh, anyway, I obviously went to the wrong career, but um, yeah, all joking aside, so I tell you kind of how I came to where I am now. So, um, I went through a past a lot very similar to David's. I went through my medical training, um, was attracted to oncology, um, both from a clinical and scientific standpoint. Um, and I actually uh, developed mentorship and fellowship, and I, I met with this mentor and I said, I, I want to be gynecologic or medical oncologist, and he said, yeah, yeah, that's great, but uh, what we're really going to do is you're going to work in this phase one clinic, and what that is, is the place in our hospital where we treat cancer patients with new medicines for the first time. And when I started this, um, the way that we did this was we had, let's say, 10 trials, and we had a wait list of patients that wanted to participate, and these, the way these studies work is they have uh, they get once one opportunity for a patient to participate a month. So it's basically like a stack, it's a queue. And when a spot came up, we look at the queue of patients, and the patient that we waited the longest just went on that trial. And there was really no idea to select patients based on who was more likely to benefit. So we were just putting the patients on on a kind of first come, first serve basis. Um, and uh, then uh, actually, you know, the field starts changing, and Dave Salah calls me into his office one day, and he said, I got this uh, trial where we're going to uh, start enrolling patients on this trial, not based on what cancer they have, and not based on how long they've been sitting on a wait list, but based on the mutations that are present in their tumor. And I said, well, that sounds like a great idea, but we don't test for these mutations, so how are we going to actually accomplish this trial? And David said, trust me, we're going to do this. Um, and you're gonna, you're gonna do this. So, so, <laughs> so I said, okay, that sounds good. So, uh, so you know, I we opened this study, and uh, I, I, this is a very important theme I want to come back to. I, I cajoled the IT people at Sloan Kettering to set up this search they had never done before, which is that if a patient had this type of genetic testing and they came back with this mutation, I would get an email. And this was like a major six month ordeal to get this set up. And uh, and I never got an email because no one had this mutation. And one day my inbox goes ping, and uh, and I get an email, this patient's mutation, open up their chart, and had this disease that I've never heard of before. I wasn't even sure it was a cancer, I had to Google it. Um, and, <laughs> and I called the company and I said, I don't know what this is, but this patient has this mutation. And can I put them on your study? And they said, sure. And uh, it turned out to be a rare, a rare form of cancer. And this woman actually was disabled from her disease. She couldn't sign a consent form. Um, she couldn't get out of a chair. She was like, well, it's the clinic. And I, uh, her husband signed the consent. And she, um, she went out on the drug. And a couple months later, she walks into the clinic uh, without a wheelchair. And his, his space is, is gone back to you know, normal living. And that was kind of the aha moment in my career. And ever since then, that's the type of work that I've been doing. So what's become my passion is trying to understand, use the technologies that these guys are developing and actually applying them to the clinic. So what are some of the challenges that I face in doing that? Um, you know, initially, we just didn't know enough about these tumors. So we had you know, very rudimentary tests, and they were applied in kind of haphazard fashion. And so uh, most of you, you get a very little bit of information and you do the best you could to interpret it. Now we have the opposite problem, which is that we're sequencing hundreds of genes capable, you know, thousands or millions of base pairs. Um, and so we get these reports and they're full of information. So that's a big challenge that Nikki can do how he is trying to make this information interpretable to clinicians because it's not just one mutation that pops out, we, we get a dozen what is important to this individual patient's tumor. So that's one challenge. Another is making sure that we have a clinical trial portfolio at our institution so that when we find these mutations, that they actually have drugs to offer to patients. And I think that's really important. Um, it's kind of 
come to the front desk if we're going to do this testing to identify things that could potentially help patients. So we can just tell them, well, you have this mutation, and if you're really great at get this drug, you don't have it. So that's a big um, aspect of my job is kind of recruiting and convincing companies to allow us to test their drugs in this fashion. Um, and I think the third challenge, which I alluded to earlier, with this kind of rudimentary email system is how do we provide this information in real time to the physicians that are treating these patients? We have over a hundred medical oncologists, I'm going to leave that number. So the you know, excellent Kettering, and you know, they, they, they handle tens of thousands of patients and patterns a year. And what we realize is that when we generate this information on a patient, um, you might do it early in the course of their disease, and they may not need that drug for sometimes years to come. We have patients that are going on studies now based on testing done years ago. So how do you provide physicians that are treating these patients with the information that these opportunities exist for their patients at the moment that they need them? And that's something that I spend a lot of time in developing these systems that provide kind of just-in-time notification to physicians as they're seeing the patients in clinic saying, think about this, this is an opportunity for them. So I think those are some of the big um, challenges that we uh, face, and it's been, it's been a really uh, satisfying experience. Thank you very much. So you can talk about yourself. <clears throat> My background is a little different, so I'm, I'm not, a, a, not a physician, not an oncologist. I, I'm training as a biochemistry and a molecular biologist. So I, Spent my undergraduate degree and my graduate degree really learning about molecular biology and how, how do cells work on the inside. And I was in I guess, dry lab. I was in the right lab. I was doing experiments. And then, but I always had the, the computer interest on the science. I was like, I just make the computers and put them down the and I really have to, really, to, to, to that, that transfer over to my, my uh, research life where I like to analyze the data. So for my, when I was trying to pick a postdoc, I realized I wanted to really expand the computational side, and I decided to do a postdoc in computational biology. Uh, not quite leaving my background behind, but, but really diving in much deeper into computational techniques, learning how to program, properly program, learning how to do proper analysis of data and R or MATLAB or what have you. And I did that for a couple of years, and then I realized at a certain point that there was no, for me at least, there was no point in diving in much deeper because I realized that my biggest strength at that time was knowing enough about the computer world that built combining that with all of my uh, biology background. I right? was one of the few people who actually could talk to scientists on both sides. And so I, I was able to uh, instruct the computer scientists, computer engineers in uh, building algorithms because they were good at building algorithms but they didn't know what the questions were. And so I was able to to link them to a question and uh, then to then find out the same details about how to solve that question. It's not just all data, right? But if you look at millions of data points, some data points are more important than others, right? How do you find the, the signal in the north? And that is especially important now that we're seeing cancer patients. There's a lot of mutations that happen in the cell happen around. Uh, but there's links a couple of with one mutation that is not around. One mutation that is the driver, it's one mutation that gives that cell a growth pattern. It just happens at the same time that you find another mutation. So finding those drivers is so people who develop other things, you want to find them, need to build it so that you can it. So my role is now really finding uh, computer scientists, guiding software engineers, and, and building out these building systems that help us in the hospital and in the research setting um, to better understand. Uh, the biology behind this cancer, but I understand how we can map, match these patients to specific treatments. So that's that's my, my background and uh, how it is a really so far now in the clinic. So trying to get one key piece that, that, that uh, we have to cover here is the connection of data to biologists and clinicians on how it is right? data scientists and getting matrices and data and brought in the text files. And maybe a lot of us can consume in an Excel spreadsheet, but it's very difficult. The more data points you have, the less idea of Excel is. So, one big step that we've taken is that we build visualization tools that connect those spreadsheets, those data text files, uh, and make them 
uh, visible to uh, oncologists, to scientists, through very simple graphics, uh, interactive, um, scattered plots, bar plots, uh, but also more complex, more customized plots, and making all this available interactively on the fly, on the web, so that it's accessible at, at any moment without delay, without even it will be direct access to that data. That's, that's one big effort that we're, we're building right now. Yeah, so thank you very much. Really, thanks for talking about this CBI report, but that's a great tool, as, as, as you were mentioning. It allows everybody to visualize the data in, in a very comprehensive uh, fashion. Uh, David, uh, sorry, uh, I'm just thinking maybe it would be a, a good idea to explain a little bit your center. What uh, your center build? Uh, what do you do? What are the kind of people that you can provisory support? So, so the center I run is, is the Marie C. and Henry Kravis Center for Molecular Oncology, and this is a center that was created uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and the goal of the center is pretty simple. So as I mentioned, cancer is a genetic disease, and what we want to start doing is personalize patients' therapy, specifically using drugs that would attack the specific underlying mutations that make their cancer grow. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to analyze every patient. And so what the center's trying to do is develop methods um, that we can analyze tumors prospectively in patients, um, work with people like Nikki to allow the clinicians to actually visualize that data. Um, and I even think he's understating the importance of the tools that he's generating. Um, many of the clinicians that that see these cancer patients, um, let alone cannot do you know command line prompt programming, um, but have simple you know typical time logging into the computer you know so so they really have to have it set up in a way that the data is really just put you know right in front of them and what is is important and so if you think about the task of that you know there's three billion base pairs of DNA. Um, they can't be shuffling through that when they've got three minutes in the clinic to look at that piece of information before they go in and talk to the patients. They have to be able to visualize it. So what the center's trying to do is accomplish that goal that will help Dave run his clinical trials. He needs to know which patients have which mutations, and to do that, we need to be able to analyze the tumors to find those mutations and then work with someone like Nikki to be able to present that in a logical way. And so we, both, we do both um, perspective analysis for known mutations, and then we have a whole effort in discovery to try to identify mutations in the patients for which we haven't found the mutation yet. So we have an assay we run in Sloan Kettering now that analyzes 410 genes. And the reason that these 410 genes were selected is that all 410 of these genes have been shown to be altered and pathogenic in patients with cancer. So these are sort of all the known knowns, all the known cancer genes. But when we run this assay on, on those 410 genes, in about 20 to 30 percent of the patients, we don't find anything that's notable. So those are patients where we looked at all the known stuff, and they've got something else, and that something else may be in the other 20,000 or so genes in the human genome, or even in the intronic regions between genes, which we historically thought was just the junk part of the genome and maybe non-functional. But we're now learning may encode for um, these very small RNAs that might influence gene expression or maybe part of a promoter or enhancer that changes the way a gene is expressed or suppressed. And so we have a whole discovery effort to try to identify what are those key drivers in the rest of those patients. And really the mission is simple. There should never be any patient who comes to Sloan Kettering that we tell them, well, we don't understand why you got your cancer. Um, that still happens to 30% of the patients. Um, that happens to almost most patients outside of Sloan Kettering because outside of Sloan Kettering, nobody's really getting sequenced at all in large part. Um, but even in Sloan Kettering where we're doing all this work, we can't solve them in every patient. And that's the commitment of the center. So hopefully the center is obsolete in 10 years. Um, that, that there isn't that question anymore um, as to why any in particular individual got their cancer. And then that doesn't mean we're done at that point. Um, we then need to collaborate with other individuals to be able to drug those mutations. And so if you look at all of our patients now, in about 30% of the patients, we find a mutation for which we have a drug, and that, that's the optimal situation. In about another 30% of the patients, we find a mutation. It's the key driving mutation in the tumor, but we have no drug. And then, as I mentioned, in the other 30%, we can't even find 
the right mutation at this point. So at some point, when we get rid of that last 30%, we're still, for some period of time, going to be in a situation where we've got the mutation, we know what the problem is, and now we need to be able to drug it. And a lot of that is biology and pharmacology, but now a lot of it is kind of computational as well. Can we solve the crystal structure of those proteins? Can we computationally identify compounds that might fit into, say, a binding pocket that might inactivate the enzyme? Can we accelerate drug discovery using computational tools and then give those ideas to Dave who, who can actually um, go ahead and test them in patients? That's really what the center tries to accomplish. Thank you very much. That's, that's very clear. Now, I'll give you an example of that that is building on what David and has already mentioned. So, in you know, on breast oncologies, and, and you now we are now sequencing uh, the breast uh, tumors uh, of all our patients with advanced disease. Turns out that we have five or six mutations that are frequent, that are in key pathways that control cancer cells. And these mutations, uh, we have therapies that we are uh, that we have available in the clinic. Now, uh, they are not frequent, so some mutations are present in only 2% or 3% of uh, patients. But if you add them all, a very significant proportion of patients have mutations that we can offer therapies. So that's the promise of what we, um, uh, people talk about, precision medicine. This is it, the capacity to look at the gene mutations that are drivers, and then have therapies that can attack that mutation and can return uh, the, the cell into a non-cancer uh, state. So we are doing this uh, last year uh, at the Memorial Sloan Catering. We entered 1,400 patients into phase one clinical trials. And we are talking to the government with the FDA and the FDA is telling us uh, very clearly, if you guys have a particular mutation that is rare, and you have a therapy that works well, we are going to prove that drug based on a small clinical trial. We don't need thousands of patients. We don't need that. Um, and it's uh, just uh, something that will change the way uh, drugs are being developed. Therapies that are less toxic, therapies that are much more efficacious, and, and therapies also that have a much longer uh, benefit than conventional therapy. So our goal one day would be to get rid of chemotherapy, and I think this is within our reach. So we are uh, very optimistic about uh, this goal. Uh, now, I'd like to address two other points, and like uh, David Hyman and Nikki to uh, comment about that. And that's another way of complexity that we need to deal with. One is tumor evolution, and the other one is the issue of tumor heterogeneity. And the third topic that I'd like you guys to comment on is the promise of what we call uh, liquid biopsies. So if you could comment on tumor evolution, on tumor heterogeneity, and on liquid biopsies, I think that would be great, and then we'll open up for questions. So um, there's a lot to unpack there. So um, one of the phenomena uh, that we see in the clinic is and that, that now has uh, become almost conventional knowledge is that tumors evolve almost under Darwinian pressure in the face of treatments that we apply, uh, be that chemotherapy or be those very selective targeted therapies that we apply in the clinic. And the way that we see this is that if you do a surgery or a biopsy at the time a patient is diagnosed, let's say with breast cancer, you sequence those genes using tests that David has described, and you look at the mutations, and then you treat that patient with a targeted therapy uh, as part of a clinical trial uh, or a chemotherapy, and then the cancer becomes resistant. Something has changed genetically in the tumor frequently, so it's all that resistance. And if you repeat the biopsy, you resequence the genes, you see changes. And actually, one of the uh, tools that Nikki has really pioneered is the ability to compare those samples and how they evolve over time. So he's created beautiful visualization tools that sort through the potentially hundreds of alterations present in the initial sample and the new sample and allow you to see the difference. And often it's the difference that's really changed 
the cancer and made it resistant. And one of the things that the reasons that that's very important for us is not only does it give us an idea of how we might recapture response or sensitivity to medicine, but it gives us an idea that um, infectious disease doctors have been applying in clinic for years, which is if you get a drug and it predictably results in a certain resistance mechanism in a cancer, maybe if you give a drug, that, that first drug, along with the drug that targets that resistance mechanism, you don't just get a slight prolongation of, of, of the development of resistance, but maybe a dramatic prolongation. We've seen that story with HIV therapy, where individual medicines might change the viral load for weeks or months, but combination medicines um, offer really long-term benefit to patients. So that's the kind of evolution uh, over time. I can test those one by one, but I want to give you the opportunity to jump in there. Yeah, so, so on the evolution I think that we have heard about now is visualizing that. I think we're doing a great at making that information visible so that the oncologist can maybe immediately see the key change that happened in the tumor post-treatment and that might explain the existence and then hopefully adapt to treatment. But I think the, the challenge in the long run is as we are gathering data on thousands of patients that are treated uh, with different therapies, it's really becomes a truly big data problem at the time we have different uh, individuals with different disease types, all of these different individuals have different genome types in the tumors. So really there are as many as uh, thousands of different uh, different tumors. They're all being treated the same way. Some of them will respond, others will not. The ones that don't respond, or the ones that respond will eventually uh, most likely uh, become resistant to the tumor changes, uh, the tumor acquires and mutations. We can then identify those, and, and now we can begin to see patterns in that. It becomes a big data problem all the time. Finding patterns that may explain resistance uh, in certain patients or may explain sensitivity in others, so that we can eventually really learn this patient with this genotype we've seen before 75 times, and they always respond when we put them on this, but they never respond when we put them on that. But we're at the beginning of that, but we have to start thinking about it now so we can solve the problems we have in the data on that. And just to echo one other thing, I think. I think uh, David's been a little bit modest about the goals of the center because one of the things that he has pioneered and that he's continuing through the center is taking advantage of the kind of serendipity that occurs in the clinic um, or these observations that typically, that historically were just viewed as oddities. So you have a patient that you give a medicine to that has metastatic disease and it goes away and never comes back. Or um, you give a medicine that the average person responds to you for four months, and three years later, the head patient's still on the medicine. And, and before, we just kind of shrugged our shoulders and said, well, that's odd. But what David and what the technology and the expertise that his center brings to bear with Nikki is to now apply kind of cutting edge genomic technology, other technology, other clinic technologies to ask the question, what was different about that patient's tumor? And not only to just intellectually satisfy why that patient was different, but that kind of phenotypic observation saying why did, this patient was extraordinary, why we did extraordinary, gives us ideas how to treat the larger population of patients. Um, the other thing that Jose was mentioning, which I think goes hand in hand, is that we have to do the So uh, essentially, we know now that not only do tumors evolve over time, but they evolve in the body in different ways and different locations. Um, so if you biopsy one site, uh, you may really need to be reading part of the story of what's experienced that that patient is dealing with. And so uh, we think one of the, the big technologies that will help us address that is actually being able to sequence the tumor genome um, through the blood. Um, and so the, you know the cancers shed their genome into the blood as they divide and die. And the, the, the beauty of that approach is that it gives you a kind of mean sampling of all the sites of disease. And that's another uh, technology that we've been working on uh, and trying to bring that to improve patient care in a variety of ways. Okay, good. So I think what we'll do now is uh, I think you have a picture of what we are uh, trying to achieve. So let's open up for discussion and questions, comments. So when I started my undergrad, uh, intro to molecular biology, RNA, I was kind of one of those chapters at the end of the book that you don't ever get tested on. And then Four years later, it became one of the main 
chapters that's kind of taught in the class. I want to know how uh, kind of medicine that's still carrying and kind of outside uh, addresses the rapid scientific and also technological evolution. And how do you guys get doctors who are maybe at the end of their careers to kind of adopt new things? Uh, and how do you kind of teach yourselves to new things that when you're kind of starting another career? So, I mean, I was just that, like, just starting with that RNI, RNI is now actually obsolete. Um, yeah, I'm so much of that out of the lab, but there's a, <laughs> there's a new technology that really has just burst onto the scene um, just within the past two years called CRISPR, um, which allows us to, in a much uh, better way, actually knock out genes um, in individual cells. Almost any individual gene. Um, is knocked out easily um, in the mammalian cells, and you can also potentially knock in mutations. And so there are these landmarks um, in science when a new technology just comes along um, and really just changes the field. And some of them are big enough that everyone notices, and, and I think with CRISPR is that that's clear you know, from anyone um, in science. I'm not sure if Dave knows what CRISPR is. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but uh, I'm going to make a potato chip or something, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> the, the, there are those landmarks, but there's a lot of small things, and, and it really is a challenge um, to keep up. And, and I think that when you're in medical school, you always say to yourself, you know, I'm going to be the type of person who never stops reading the William Journal. You know, I'm going to read all the big papers and keep up on everything. Um, and then what you quickly realize is just it's impossible to do everything. Um, um, and then you got to pick and choose, but, but if you're not someone who is continually learning um, new skills and new information, um, you will be quickly passed um, in this type of field. So um, the whole buggy whip idea of what you're doing you know, can become obsolete um, is incredibly true in what we do. And it's, it's already, I've seen it, I've, I've run my own lab in the last eight years, I've been in some Karen for almost 18. Um, and just during that period of time, I've seen people who've invested their entire career on some particular technology have that technology become completely obsolete. So the key is flexibility and, and, and learning new skills. Um, you know, and you know, people can do that, but if you get so bogged down on one technology, you're gonna have to have fun. I think the most important thing is to focus, first of all, be in your field and 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 talk for the but then focus on the question, not on the technology. You know, the, the technology is just a tool that allows you to address the question and it will change. Now, as technology gets better, it allows you to answer questions otherwise you could not answer. But it's about being focused, it's about being asking the right questions. It's about being in a community that is large. So as from Kevin, we have seven hundred uh, scientists and a thousand physicians, and we have uh, daily conferences, we have teams of people that get together. And then it's also about pushing yourself, you know. Uh, a lot of people in front of mine, I'm a physician in chief, I don't need to do it. I don't need to do it. I've been rejected, you know, the famous R01 last year, I had one, I didn't get it. I got pissed off, I got upset, I was, and you know, this year I did it again. And I got the three percent. That's the first thing I did. I completely got it. But it's uh, for you. Yeah. Yes. But you see, put yourself try to be uh, in, in, in that. But I think if you could focus on the idea and you know you feel well, I think it's actually quite feasible to to, to be in academia and to have a career. As a matter of fact, the most challenging time in academia is the transition. From a system to a social. Uh, that's, the, that's where people fall off the uh, You know, people that get the first position in those first years, and that's where we put a lot of our resources to help people make the transition from a system to a social. Once they are associated, they, they, they do well, they keep on going, they keep being on, on, on the edge. So, great. Over there. So, on that same line of thought about not being able to keep up with the literature, um, I'm sure we've all heard about IBM Watson, and I mean this is a machine that can instantaneously access all the literature at once and come up with predictive suggestions on what to do. And we may have also heard headlines about what MSK is doing with this. So I wanted to ask you how you're using 
the oncology advisor feature of this um, in the clinic for deciding who's going to be on the clinical trials and what sort of ways you can receive these places. So I'll, I'll just tell you the, the problem, and then Ty Wiki should handle the answer to this. Um, you know, I, I see patients in clinic. I got to sit on my day. 15 or so patients will come in. And, um, these are pretty sophisticated patients, um, and they have done their research. So, you know, they've been on Google all night um, looking at their particular problem, and they come in very, very well informed. And I think the doctors really do need help um, from some sort of technology um, to make sure that they don't look stupid, you know? Because, <laughs> you know, especially now that the genetic data is coming in, you know? Um, you know, we'll generate a report, it'll have 29 innovations on it, the doctor doesn't even know what they are. Um, they've never heard of that gene. Um, and that's not that's not the doctor's fault. I mean, there's 20 plus thousand genes in the genome. How do you keep up with that amount of information? So we're actually leaning on Nikki um, to really be able to provide that tool. So I don't know if you want to give a... Yeah, I, I, I don't have I've never used the, the Watson uh, oncology system, so I've seen it being presented and Besides, so it looks great. I haven't been able to Okay, so let me work with the question for quite a time. This is a different question. 80%, 80% of uh, oncology patients are taken care of by community oncologists, uh, people that take care of multiple different types. It's impossible. Now, in the case of the Sully, you know, who is working in blood cancer or in melanoma, he knows his data call, right? I mean, the VIVA mutation data. So this is um, less of a tool that is required in strong academic communities. But when you are here, uh, we believe that Watson is going to be very important. And the way it goes with Watson is that it has a first component, which is a natural language uh, uh, learning system that they can extract uh, extract data from the chart that is non-structured data. I mean, it's very important because these patients live many, many years, and they have received so many therapy, there are so many variables that a normal person cannot keep that information in their mind. So Watson does that, and uh, takes all the data that is appropriate uh, for the question you want to ask. Then, uh, oncologists from Memorial, we fit the machine with our with our algorithms. So it's not that the literature. The literature is something that is being done, for example, the Neogenome Center is doing that. Uh, we feel that that has some vulnerabilities because there's a lot of garbage being followed. Uh, and I don't think Watson can get distinguished garbage from one garbage. Uh, it will be one day, but not by now. Um, and I think that we need some expert curator uh, that is the best in the field that goes in. So we have uh, 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 our own colleagues that fit the machine with our algorithms. If you have that, you need to consider that. Then the literature plays a role. And then all the data from clinical trials that are available around the world gets also into the system. And then Watson um, learns, uh, because then it is a process in which uh, our guys monitor the way things are being decided. And what happens is that uh, at the end, it gives you a number of suggestions. And also takes into account the patient um, preferences. So for example, if there's a patient that says, listen, if I don't move my hair, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I don't care. I'm not playing ball here. So that also um, goes into the computer. And at the end, it gives you a list of options. And then the physician and the patient can discuss. And it also gives you a probability uh, of how confident is one son of what so sometimes it say you know my confidence is only 30 percent that means that you cannot have that thing there's no data in some other cases like in breast cancer for conventional therapy it will tell you my confidence is 99 percent and that gives you a sense and then you choose from the that's the way now it's easier said than done we are not there yet uh, we are testing better mm -hmm. Somebody, I think, than in Canada, and we'll see how this evolves. But I think the principle of the concept is a very, very important one. 
Yes, you're familiar with the immune uh, system stimulators, the anti-PD-1s and the anti-PD-L1s. Do you view that as a, as a parallel pathway to the approach of going after the genetic basis of the disease, or is it complementary? Is it going to come together? Are you pulling those together in your own program? So there's a recent set of papers that has been published. Uh, one was by Tim Chan, and then Morrison Kennery, um, highlighting that in part the immune system is part of the heterogeneity of responses to those drugs. And what I mean by that is some patients do really well, and some patients don't respond at all. Um, that that can be linked. Can you explain in just one sentence what the studies are? Yeah. yeah. So there's a new class of therapies that really is revolutionary. Um, these are drugs that um, take a break off of the immune system that is preventing the immune system from attacking the cancer cells. So the cancer cells are seen as part of the normal body, and so the immune system doesn't eliminate them. And we know for a long time that people with immunodeficiency disorders get more cancer. Um, people with HIV or other, you know, uh, you know, inborn. Uh, immune uh, problems. And this new class of drugs essentially takes the break off of that immune system um, and the, the cancer then gets attacked by the immune system. And what really is revolutionary about them is that we are seeing cures in cancers that before that there were no good treatments. Um, we're seeing a third or maybe even as many as 50% of patients with metastatic melanoma um, being cured by this new class of drugs. This was a a diagnosis that even five years ago, um, the average life expectancy was less than six months. So this is just a revolution. We're seeing these drugs work in lung cancer, bladder cancer, but not in everyone. They work in some patients and they cure them. Some patients respond for a while and then progress, and then other patients um, don't respond at all. And we don't understand completely why there's that variability in response, but definitely part of it actually is linked to the genetics of the tumor. And as opposed to the, it being linked to a specific protein that's getting activated in the drug and gives that protein like we see with targeted therapies, what may be happening in this case is that when you get a hypermutated tumor, a tumor that has a lot of mutations, that then expresses a lot of proteins on the cell surface that are not like the normal cells, they're seen as less like a normal U cell. Um, and when you take the breaks off the immune system, you attack the cancer. Um, with, with, with that immunotherapy. And so it may turn out that the same genetic profile that we're doing to identify patients for the correct target therapy may also be telling us which patients are most likely um, to respond to the immunotherapy. So I think that's part of it. I also think there's inherited, you know, in, intrinsic differences between patients that may make them better candidates for this um, than others. So I don't want to oversimplify it, but I think it's all linked. And I, I think it gets back down to the underlying issue of why did you get your cancer? What's making it grow? How's your cancer different than normal cells? And then using that information to customize the therapy. And the customization could be, let's give it a therapy because you have a hypermutated tumor. Um, but we're really at the basic understanding of that. Um, we probably need to do lots more exomes and genomes to understand this variability from patient to patient so we can really understand why patients are responding the best. And we do that not just to figure out prognostically who's going to do well and who's going to do poorly. We're trying to figure out why do the patients who do poorly do poorly so that maybe we can add a second drug, a combination or a third drug that can take a patient who's going to do poorly with a single drug and turn them into a patient who's going to do well. Maybe we need to figure out how to hypermutate a regular tumor to make it a better target for the immune system. It's actually not a bad um, idea. And actually, some of the strange things out of the data is that um, lung cancer patients who are smokers are more likely to respond to um, these immunotherapies than patients who did not smoke. Now, that doesn't mean everyone should smoke, so that if you have lung cancer, you're going to respond to these uh, drugs. But what we may find is that we may be able to get uh, a chemotherapy that disrupts DNA repair specifically in the cancer cells and not in normal cells, makes them more hypermutated and then makes them more responsive um, to the immunotherapy. We actually have a parallel example um, with a, a doctor, uh, James Bacon, who's head of our thyroid group, where he's able to give a, a targeted therapy which causes overexpression of a protein that makes the cells sensitive to a type of radiation. So you can imagine that kind of rational combination being developed when you understand the biology. And to understand the biology, we need to be able to understand millions of data points. That's the future.
I have a question. You mentioned precision medicine, but nowadays, I guess, with all these select patients getting it, sometimes the genetic information doesn't agree with the cause of things, doesn't agree with the problem to see. So I've noticed a lot of times you have like this tumor board meeting where you have oncologists, pathologists, and computational biologists meeting and discussing patient patient treatment together. But if you want to expand precision medicine to everyone gets it, a meeting like that probably isn't feasible or scalable in the broad sense. So how do you see it progressing? You see yeah, maybe they should take that again because we have gone away from the tumor board system. Um, we're sequencing, you know, if we're going to be sequencing a thousand patients a month, we can't do that. So Dave has worked to develop tools to be able to, you know, not have a tumor board, but have that automatically flag computation. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, it, it, it's somewhat the way that we've differentiated our approach is on veterans. So some institutions, as you're referring to, have Designed really beautiful genomic tests that um, look maybe at every single gene in the tumor, and they convene all the experts in the institution and they study the results and they annotate them beautifully and they come up with a unified kind of recommendation. Um, the problem is is that to actually move the field forward, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So Jose was mentioning that. Um, there are breast cancers that have uh, mutations in them that are clearly driving them, but only present in 2% of breast cancer. So if you take that approach of, of doing what you described and, and doing it in 100 patients a year, you may never find a breast cancer patient that has that mutation and never be able to make the observation that if you give them a drug, that they respond. So we've taken, I think, a, 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 a middle ground, a very pragmatic approach, where we offer a very, very good test not a perfect test, but a very good test, to a very large number of patients. We put um, automated systems in place to interpret that data based on the, the best scientific knowledge available that's been curated. We then don't rely on the physicians to follow those curations. But you put in, this gets to your point, you put in another layer of protection which is systems where the experts at the institution have the studies that can help these patients don't wait for the physician to raise their hand. They go to the patient. Yeah, but don't go on. We use the early part, the discovery part. That we, don't, we are studying. But don't go in the future. Uh, we want to know what it means. We want to know every mutation, what does it mean. And we want to know what therapies are, are available. So we are building already a clinical annotation network in which, so I think you're pointing through right, we need to make it in a way that everybody can understand and can have access to making decisions. Um, the concept of the world also goes against the practice of medicine because the practice of medicine is based on the decision between, you know, the physician and the patient. Uh, I, I, I take it to myself. Um, you know, I say sometimes that this is like a, like, like a refugee of the Power for the person that cannot make decisions. You know, if you are the physician, you make decisions, you have the data, uh, it has to be accurate, but you need to make decisions. So I think uh, that's something that needs to be solved, and we need to find ways that that data can be understood so people can make decisions. So as the director of the ones like that, too, before, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we, we, we really don't, we really don't have traditional type of tumor board, we've used our tumor board um, as more of an educational venue, let's highlight interesting cases. Um, because at the volume of patients we're seeing, if there's one interesting case like that, there's going to be another one the next week. And so we're just trying to get out there that information. You know, if you had this scenario, this is the way you treat it, trying to educate, you had that question about education earlier, um, that's really our use of the tumor board. More questions? A warning, he's a warning, he's a future plan. So it's a great question. Um, I'll just address part of it. Maybe one of the other guys want to jump in. But um, the asset that we've designed, a major part of the design was to bring the cost down. And so just to quickly go through that in one second, um, we've created a way where we can take DNA from multiple patients, 30 or 40 patients, chop up the DNA. We actually 
attach a barcode to the DNA so that we can mix up DNA from 30 or 40 patients at the same time so we can do a reaction um, using less reagents and less sequencing costs. And then we use a computer, a very powerful set of computational tools at the end to use that DNA barcode that we've attached to the DNA to figure out which piece of DNA came from which patient. We also capture parts of the DNA and don't sequence the whole genome. We sequence the parts of the, the DNA that are most likely to have these cancer mutations. And again, all of this is to drive down the cost. And hopefully that will continue. Um, but the costs are still probably too high for this to get done in everyone. And eventually, we'll take that 410 gene assay and hopefully be doing a broader assay um, when the costs come down. But there's really three main components of the cost right now. Um, one is a pathology cost. You know, we need a, usually a doctor to look at the tumor and sort of scrape around the, the non-tumor parts. We need something on the genetic testing. And then the computational part is about half right now. We still need people to look at the data and people are expensive. And so we can program algorithms to to do a lot of that work, it'll be cheaper. Uh, a little bit more time to week that, but I see the questions there. One there. And, yeah. um, so I'm just wondering. Um, there, so as as we understand more about the genome, we know that there's you know more functional aspects than we knew. You know, there's epistasis going on that we're only have really even begun to understand. Um, and then we're trying to bring in this clinical data. So we're huge cursor dimensionality on the analysis side. And then in science, we have this huge thing of data siloing. And even with these um, you know, collaborations that are out there, you're still like the number of patients you need if you start doing any kind of complex phenomena disorder are just like you know way beyond what you were normally going to get. You know, <laughs> so like, how do you think? Like, what do you think? You know, how will we approach that? Because from a scientific perspective, there's always a tension. You want to hold on to the data, and and on top of that, data security. Uh, privacy and security. <laughs> We're going to take three more questions. Okay. We started with this. Yes, I think I've said this before, but we don't have enough data yet to really do all the things we want to do. Right? So this, I think it's more data as costs go down. Uh, but really, one center can't do it alone. Right? So I think this will be a phase where each center is doing it alone. We partly, because centers will be first, they want to be first to publish this or that. But eventually, I think, uh, it's starting now, we, we have to start sharing data from my institutions. Um, one, one effort right now is uh, started by the AACR and partly by us, Project G, which is a, a pilot stage. We <coughs> have to share it in between uh, maybe five to ten major cancer institutes around the world. <coughs> sharing data means sharing data, maybe not all the raw data, but data results, sequencing results, sharing in a de identified way. This is a security issue and, and then having safeguards in place that people will really scoop each other. You can use data to inform your own decisions that maybe don't publish on it. Uh, so data sharing is going to be a big uh, the, the, the key for uh, this. The next level is sharing the raw genomic data because as we know it's identifiable. Uh, you can you know, it's, it's a sequence you can identify that, that, that person. How do you make that accessible <coughs> without giving away the actual data? And so there are people thinking about cloud-based system where you can actually compute on other people's genomes without actually having access to the data. So you, you, you compute on the data which is stored on a secure location, you compute it and you get the results, which may not be enough to really be uh, uh, reset aside that, that person's identity. Um, Hi, um, I just have a quick question with regards to that question about the cancers and sort of the type of work we might be doing on that because um, you know, variant cancer, you don't really have very good, you know, predictors in terms of even just CA125. So many different things that can elevate that. So I'm interested to know with that triple cancer, the other natural cancer, in terms of the original yeah, I think uh, you're, you're referring to a tumor marker, which is a protein you can catch in the blood associated with the cancer. Um, one of the things that we're very interested in is applying some of these technologies to early detection, which I think is really where we need to go. Um, we do understand that, uh, I don't want to go into all the details, but essentially uh, there are certain mutations that occur very early on in the development of these cancers. Maybe those could be applied. Um, protection of those could be applied in certain clinical settings to detect um, cancers early, which is really ultimately where we need to go. I mean, it's very good to treat patients with metastatic cancer and help them live longer, but I think we've all seen this technology being applied 
um, to early detection as well. And really, curing patients um, before they develop over the side disease, which has been the challenge to the learning kids. I don't know if I have time to go into it, full detail, but I think it's something that we think a lot about and it's very hard on here. One other thing, one of the big questions that I think I like to mention to you is that. Uh, the genes that are mutant are well known, and uh, that's a place where you have sometimes very impressive family histories. So we are applying uh, an initiative that is looking at genuine patients, uh, not only the patients, but in the families. So the idea would be in a very impressive one of the first places where you would be able to identify uh, families of risk and, and to be. So this is a really cool analysis pipeline that you guys have built out here. Congratulations. Uh, there are a couple of little companies that have built great businesses out of doing similar stuff. I, I was just wondering if beyond sharing the data you're generating, would, would you or do you sell access to pipeline to other hospitals and cancer centers? I'll take that uh, question. Uh, we um, have built a relationship with a company called Quest. Uh, Quest is one of the pathology uh, companies that has deep presence in, in many, uh, you know, the, uh, at least most of the same pathology pathology. So we build it with them. So we build with them a relationship. That's on the commercial side. Now, on the academic side, uh, we have full commitment to share our data. Uh, I think the IP is not going to be in sharing the data, the IP is in the interpretation of the data. And, and that's our value proposition to the request initiative that we have. So we have that and we have other institutions going on. And then many of our software is available as open source software. So see my code, for example, is an open source project. Uh, I'm not going to have But the pipelines that we're using are not our own. Take them from other open source uh, resources, we modify the slides, and some of them go back in other repositories. So, a lot of the items are using actually open source. Proposition could be take that database, 
use a combination of known uh, ontologies, uh, natural language processing, and try to pull out the key pieces and put it in a more structured form. Those are, those are a little example of, a little example of something useful. Yeah. Uh, recently, about a month ago, we were called by the National Science Foundation, which is a huge funding body, uh, to go to Princeton to the Institute of Science Studies. So they called a bunch of guys from, from the world, the Harvard, uh, guys from Princeton themselves, and guys from the world of Kevin. And, and uh, we were all people like us, together with a number of physicists and mathematical guys with a visual background. So, for example, we need to model the systems. Uh, uh, you know, at least therapies cannot be given a single agent because every cell has a repertoire uh, of pathways that they can turn on once you block one therapy with one treatment. So the point of combination therapies in immune sexual uh, blockade is critical. You know, when you combine PD-1 and CT of 4, you do much better. So, uh, so the issue on understanding model the systems, model tumor evolution, Model combination therapies, that's another, actually I would say this is the bigger thing. So the National Science Foundation came up, after, we had a four-day retreat, and after that, they came up with a funding initiative, and they're going to give us $40 million just to study this, and it's going to be good. So I think the number of questions that we have are endless, um, and so uh, it's, it's a very, very broad field here. Great, well, I'd like to thank the panel for our Thank you very much.